oh my god this is this is just so much i had no idea this was coming okay welcome back guys dr h here again and today i'm going to be looking at lara croft go and kim kardashian hollywood i'm going to be talking about text so if you're studying this game for your aqa hang on because you're about to get all the good things that you need to get a high grade so I'm going to start off with a little bit about game genres. Game genres are slightly different from film genres. Uh, game genres are often defined by what you do. So, for example, in a puzzle game, you try to solve puzzles. In a survival horror game or survival game, you try to survive. So, both of these games class as casual games. A uh, casual game is something that you can pick up and put down, play a bit now, come back to it later. Uh, casual games kind of took off in the early noughties. Um, so, you know, you had things even before then that sort of shipped with PCs, games like Solitaire, Minesweeper, but they were really kind of popularized by consoles like the Wii and later on by devices like smartphones. Um, so casual games brought new audiences to gaming. Uh, it sort of changed the stereotype of the lone male gamer playing for hours on end, the kind of the hardcore geek gamer. Um, now, you know, senior citizens were playing, so-called silver gamers. Uh, Middle-aged women were playing games. Games weren't just for children and geeks anymore. The thing with games like Solitaire and Minesweeper and even Wii Sports to an extent was that you still had to be in front of your computer or your console in order to make them work. Obviously, later on, with the improved processing power and speed of mobile phones, especially smartphones, uh, this meant that the vast majority of casual games migrated across onto phones. In fact, a study by NativeX in 2017 um, showed that mobile games not only generate more money than console games, but they have done this since 2015. Now, a large portion of this money comes from so-called freemium games, games that are free to download and play, but offer in-app purchases. Um, these sometimes work a bit like downloadable content on consoles where you could download, say, new levels or new costume skins for your characters. Um, but more frequently, freemium games tend to operate a pay-to-play system where the player can avoid having to wait for things like health, actions, or energy to recharge by buying more, or, um, by, buying more by buying more of these economies using real-world currency. So in the UK, I could spend my real pounds, my real uh, English pounds, on things like energy for Kim Kardashian. There is an excellent send-up of this in South Park, uh, season 18, episode 6, uh, called Freemium Isn't Free, and there's a link in the description online if you want to watch it. Um, it pretty much covers all of the problems with freemium games, um, so I'm not going to rehash all of its arguments here. So let's take a look at our two games. I mean, one of the first things I wanted to talk about was a, a word I was stumbling around in my playthroughs. I kept saying sort of things like, oh, it's, it's, it's glitzy, it's glamorous. The word I'm looking for is juicy. Now, juicy is a phrase that was coined by someone called Kyle Gabler. Uh, it's written about in a book by Jesper Yule called um, A Casual Revolution. It's a fantastic book all about the birth of casual games. Um, but juiciness is essentially, well, it's essentially like this. <laughs> Juiciness is an explosion of colour and sound and is really kind of gratifying, offering instant reward, showing the player that they've done something that's really that they're supposed to do. It's a way of kind of um, taking the player through the game and, sh and showing them the things they need to do in order to succeed. So as you can see in Kim Kardashian Hollywood, for example, if I complete uh, one of my goals, then I'll get this explosion of colour and things to tap, 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 tap all over the screen and collect. Um, less so in Laura Croft, but we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, when you're analysing the look of the visual look of a game, there's lots of tools you can use. A semiotic analysis is perhaps one of the best, and there's a frame stop coming up here. So, in Laura Croft, if we take a semiotic uh, approach, the graphics are quite low res, the low resolution, because it's for a phone, not for a console. But they're not cartoony. They're not cartoony in the way that um, Kim Kardashian is. Uh, they're, they're aiming to mimic the kind of photorealistic style of the console releases, but obviously with a device that's got a much smaller processing power. Um, there's a real attempt to create threat in the game with this recurring element of the boss, the snake, that keeps coming around and kind of you have to hide from him and you have to sort of shimmy along walls and stay ahead of him, um, with all the phallic imagery that that contains. And here's a frame stop to explain that. Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. <laughs> Thanks for the tip.
With Kim Kardashian Hollywood, there is definitely a more cartoony, rounded, kind of friendly feel to the animations. They use uh, what some people refer to as Disney eyes. These are sort of soft, rounded, amiable eyes designed to make people feel at ease when playing and so more likely to part with their hard-earned cash to continue playing and avoid having to wait. So if we look a little bit at the game progression in these two games, Kim Kardashian Hollywood, you make progress by completing tasks, jobs, making appearances at various events, going on dates. And the simple mechanic all the way through these things is you're given a list of actions you can do, so that might include, you know, ordering a drink or kissing your date or dancing or whatever else. And if you tap on it, this action costs energy. The energy is up at the top of the screen. Every time you take an action, you lose the energy, and the energy refills over time. It's the classic time-based mechanic of wait to play, or as I was saying earlier, pay to play. Energy can be refilled by buying more energy using real world currency, or sometimes by watching a video, which of course is generating ad revenue for the company Glue Mobile. Now in Lara Croft Go, it's a very different affair. You make progress by passing through levels. Each level is a puzzle. So the original Lara Croft Tomb Raider games had an element of puzzle. You know, you were kind of pushing blocks around, figuring out where stuff goes. But they were much more action-adventure. You were running, jumping, gunning things down, you know, shooting. It was, it was much more that than puzzle. This is definitely a puzzle game. In order to make progress through the game, you have to determine the right order in which to make your moves. Otherwise you get killed and you have to start the level again. Um, there's no time limit on individual levels and of course you can quit out of a level and load back in in the way that you can with casual games. And you have infinite ammunition. It's not really about conserving ammo or saving it for the bosses. It's more about figuring things out. So in both of these games you've got two very different ways in which the narrative is being delivered. In Lara Croft Go, for example, there really isn't much intrinsic narrative. There are two types of narrative. You can talk about intrinsic and extrinsic, uh, or internal and external. So an internal narrative would be something delivered by a cutscene, something delivered by dialogue, something that tells you what's going on in the world and anchors you in the story. By contrast, in Lara Croft Go, it's mostly external, it's mostly extrinsic narrative. We are supposed to impose a story on what we see. We kind of have to make up the story for ourselves. She's Lara Croft, she's going through a temple, she's looking for artifacts, she's solving puzzles, she's staying one step ahead of the snake, but we never really know why she's doing these things. Now, this is very different, starkly different, in fact, from Kim Kardashian Hollywood. In Kim Kardashian Hollywood, we are far more concerned with... Uh, the story being told through text and through location, the various rivalries that the game throws up. So, for example, you're friends with Kim Kardashian, but you're enemies with Willow Pape or Willow Pape, and some people have likened her to the real-world Paris Hilton. Um, and the narrative is delivered through on-screen text. There's quite a lot of reading in this game. Um, and in addition to that, if you look at the sorts of goals and sorts of missions that you're sent on, they're very different from the Lara Croft Go game. In, in Kim Kardashian Hollywood, you are going to an event, you're trying on dresses, you're posing for a photo shoot, you're going on dates. It's all fairly real world stuff and things that relate to emphasized femininity, as I said in my analysis of the Kim Kardashian game. By contrast, in Lara Croft Go, the narrative is more being delivered by just moving from location to location to location. There's really very little on-screen text. There's the occasional map that pops up that's not really a map. It's more of a diagram of how many levels you have to do. There might be a, an interesting name involving snakes or spiders or whatever else. But essentially, it's just you imposing a narrative on the game. So if you want to apply some narrative theory to this, you could look at prop and you could talk about the hero and the princess that they're trying to rescue, which in the case of Lara Croft is the treasure, and in the case of Kim Kardashian Hollywood is your kind of A-list career, that's the princess, that's the thing you're trying to get. But ultimately I think you kind of run out of things to say fairly quickly with prop and video games, and most of it's already been said. So instead I want to talk about um, a theory called binary opposition and Claude Levi Strauss, and there's a frame stop for binary opposition coming up now. So if we look at the opposites in Lara Croft, 
we seem to be talking about kind of human and monster. This drives a lot of the action forwards. So obviously there's the puzzle element, but most of the obstacles in these puzzles are monsters. Monsters that will kill you, they will turn you from being alive to being dead, which is another binary opposition in games, uh, if you don't figure out the right way to kill them first. So you have to kill them before they kill you. And that's what drives most of the action forwards. Now in Kim Kardashian Hollywood, something very interesting is happening with binary opposition, because the binary opposition seems to be between success and failure. And it's not the sort of normal gamey success of, oh, can I, can I get this artifact? Can I find this um, device? Can I rescue this princess? In Kim Kardashian Hollywood, the, the binary oppositions between success and failure are seen through your relationship with some of the other characters. Who are you feuding with? Who are you friends with? How does this affect your status? Is it pushing you up the ranks? Are you getting closer to being an A-list celebrity or a D-list in the first instance? Are you dropping further down the rankings? In terms of your relationships, are you further up? Are you in the top 100? Are you in the top 50? Are you in the top 10? And you're constantly measuring yourself against the success of the expectations and values that are imposed by the world or by, by, by the world of Kim Kardashian which is you know you have to be a celebrity you have to be successful you have to chase fame but also you're measuring yourself against other real players so you can invite your real friends to come and play um, Kim Kardashian with you in a way that Lara Croft Go really isn't so hopefully I haven't rambled my way too much through this video and hopefully you're now equipped with a few more things that you could say in your video games section of your exams. Thank you very much for listening and as always, happy hunting.